Hi friends, welcome to lesson three of Science as a Verb. This is gonna be a discussion of significant figures, what they are and how to use them. So here you see a pencil, right? And this pencil, the measurement is being recorded as 18.73 centimeters in length. And if somebody gave you this pencil and gave you this ruler and had you measure it, and then they told you that they measured it to be 18.73 centimeters in length, you'd probably be cool with that. If they told you it was 19, you might think they were a little sloppy, but you'd probably be okay with that. If they told you it was 18.7, you'd probably be cool with that too. But if they told you it was 18.73829641984, you'd probably be a little bit suspicious about that. And you should be, because this ruler doesn't allow anybody to make that kind of measurement with any degree of certainty. That's what significant figures enable us to do. They are the numbers that we know with certainty in a particular measurement. So let's talk about them, and then we'll see if we can try practicing with a couple of examples here in this lesson. Before we get into it, let's get a handle on these notions of accuracy and precision. Precision is pretty simple. Precision is just the level of detail with which you can make a particular measurement. In our previous example of the pencil on the ruler, the precision of that measuring device enabled us to make measurements to the nearest hundredth of a centimeter using that ruler, which is why it was 18.73 centimeters in length. Accuracy is a little bit different. Accuracy is how close a particular measurement is to its actual accepted value. Sort of the classic example to explain this is a dartboard and looking at the pattern of darts on that dartboard. If you're both accurate and precise, your pattern of darts are always going to be on the bullseye in very close space. You could also be precise but not accurate. In that case, you would continue to make your throws to the same location, but that location is not actually close to the bullseye that you're aiming for. And of course, you can be like me, neither accurate nor precise in your dart throwing ability, in which case your throws are going to go all over the dartboard and you're never going to hit the bullseye except by random chance. When we're making measurements, we want to be as precise as we possibly can be, and we want to be accurate in our measurements. But we can only count the numbers that we should count count. We're limited by the precision of our measuring device. So let's take a look at how we actually should make our measurements when we make them in the laboratory. The thing that we have to deal with when we're making measurements in the laboratory is the uncertainty. Where do we stop measuring? The rule is that we always measure to one place beyond a device's smallest markings. This is going to be the rule for determining the significance in a particular measurement. I've got three different rulers on this page. For each one, their precision is limited by the markings on the device. What I'm going to do is put up three different lines and I'd like you to practice making measurements with each one. Here's the first one. Take a moment and write down your measurement and then see if it compares to mine. I measured this to be 6.2 centimeters. The reason for that is because this ruler has markings to the nearest whole centimeter and I made one estimate beyond that to the tenths of a centimeter. Now if you did this and you had something like 6.3 centimeters, don't be concerned about that. That estimation piece is always going to be the most uncertain part and so it's not uncommon to have that waver back and forth a little bit. But if you measured this to be 6.9 centimeters, that's a problem. Or if you measured this just to be 6 centimeters, that is also a problem because you have one additional degree of precision beyond the markings on the device. Here's the second line. Take a moment and make your measurement and then see how it does. I measured this to be 0.47 centimeters in length. I think the reason for that is probably pretty obvious at this point. This ruler goes to the nearest tenths in its markings, and so I can measure to one place beyond that, and so I thought that there would be a seven occupying the hundredths place based on how long this particular line is. Here's our final one. Take a moment and write down your measurement, and then let's see how it agrees with mine. I measured this to be 63 centimeters in length. And the reason for this is because this ruler has markings to every 10 centimeters. I made one measurement beyond that to the ones place. That's the rule, right? We always go to one place beyond a device's smallest markings. One thing that we need to be careful of is when we measure liquids that adhere to the surfaces of our containers. Water is a very common example of this. When we do this, we're going to see a curve, which we call a meniscus, characteristic of having water in a measuring device. The rule here is to always make our measurements from the bottom of the meniscus. The same rule of making one estimate beyond the markings on the device applies here, which is why I measured this particular water level to be 21.6 milliliters, but I made that estimation by going one place beyond where I thought the bottom of that curve or the bottom of the meniscus was. Something to keep in mind when you use this device. Similarly, when we deal with electronic devices, which we will do quite a bit, 
we can't go any place beyond the precision that's being given by our device for reasons that I should think are probably pretty obvious. That's how we're going to deal with measurements when we're taking measurements in the laboratory. The other thing that we're going to spend a lot of time doing is dealing with measurements that we've been given in problems and other situations. For those, we have to have an ability to determine the significant figures in those numbers for the purpose of calculations, which we'll discuss in our next lesson. But we're going to need to have a series of significant figure rules to help us deal with this. The first rule is pretty simple. All non-zero integers in a number are significant numbers. Not too much to say about that one. Once we start to put zeros in, however, zeros could either be known with certainty or they could just be placeholders. In order to determine that, we use a couple of rules to help us figure out numbers with or without a decimal point. For numbers without a decimal, any zeros to the right of the last non-zero number are not significant unless we indicate it through some devices that I'll show you on our next slide. For numbers with a decimal, all zeros to the left of the first non-zero number are not significant. In both of these cases, these zeros are just acting as placeholders to help determine the magnitude of our number, and as such, they should not be counted as significant figures or numbers known with any certainty in our measurement. The last thing that I'll point out is that exact counts of things, like 24 students in a class, are infinitely precise. They have an unlimited number of significant figures for the purpose of things like calculations. Let's see if you can use these significant figure rules to figure out the number of significant figures in each of these measurements. Take a moment and write down the number of significant figures you see in each of these numbers, and then when you're ready, hit play and let's work through each example. In A and in B, there are six significant figures. Can you figure out why? The reason is because all of these numbers are non-zero numbers in the, both of these measurements, so the decimal point doesn't even really matter. All non-zero numbers are significant in any measurement. In C, there is only one significant figure. It's because there's only one non-zero number in this measurement, and there's no sort of indication that the zeros in this measurement should be counted as significant. If we did know those zeros with significance, we could do one of two things. If we knew that they were all significant, we could simply put a decimal point after that last zero. That's a signal that all of the zeros in this measurement are in fact known with certainty. That's why the decimal is there. Of course, a more common situation would be like something in E, where we know that the first three zeros are significant, but the last two are not. In that case, we put a line over the last significant zero, which indicates that it and the ones that came before it are all significant. So for E, there are four significant figures for that particular reason. F, G, and H all have decimal points present, and that changes things a little bit. F has one significant figure. The reason for this is because that's the only non-zero number in the measurement, and all of those zeros upstream of that one are just helping to indicate that that one occupies the hundred thousandths place of our measurement in terms of its magnitude. In G, we've got three significant figures. The one and the zero and the one are all significant. That zero would not be there if we did not know it with certainty, and certainly we have enough certainty in this measurement to even know that the one that comes after that zero are still significant. H has six significant figures for the same reason. All of those zeros between those two ones would not be written down if we did not know them with certainty. The fact that we do know them with certainty is the only reason that they're on that page. The best way to get your head around significant figures is to practice measuring and to practice with problems determining the number of significant figures. We're going to do a lot of practice in class, but certainly if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write them down. You can leave them in the comments after this video, or you can touch with me through the contact link in the info field underneath this video. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Take it easy.